What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of How To with Ann Malum. Today, I am thrilled to have Bill Courtney with us. Coach Bill Courtney is the founder of Classic American Hardwoods in Memphis, Tennessee, the subject of the Oscar-winning football documentary, Undefeated, author of the book, Against the Grain, and recently launched his own podcast called An Army of Normal Folks, which I've had the pleasure to be on. And he seeks to build a movement that can change the country. Bill's how-to is just that, how to build a movement that can change the country. Bill, nice to have you here and really good to see you again. It's great to see you again too, Anne. Well, I'm going to start with a little background, of course, so people can get familiar with you. So I want to talk a little bit about your upbringing and how it relates to the things that you've done and why you felt the purpose in your life to do them. Um, I'm a Memphis guy, um, grew up in Memphis, went to school only, uh, an hour away from Memphis, Ole Miss, and, uh, came back to Memphis. So my roots are Memphis and I doubt I'll ever leave, um, Memphis, uh, as my, my residence. Um, mom was, uh, divorced at, when I was four, dad left, um, Actually, my father died since I've seen you, mm-hmm. and um, I hear that it, it it is sad when anybody dies. But uh, somebody called me and let me know. Um, mm-hmm. That's kind of the relationship I had. Um, there was none. Mom loved me a lot, um, and and did her best to to care for me, but. Um, was married and divorced five times. Uh, my mom's fourth husband shot at me down a hallway uh, one night with a pistol. I had to dive out a window to save myself. And so we came up with not a lot financially. Um, and uh, frankly, I, I grew up with a lot of trauma in my life of men in and out of my life. And, you know, is a I, I lettered in six sports in high school. And, um, so, you know, I'm, I was this kind of, I mean, I don't want to, yeah, I was kind of an alpha male, young 15, 16, 17 year old guy who, um, on the outside, you know, was making good grades and doing all the things you're supposed to do despite all the ridiculous dysfunction at home, but inside was filled with insecurities and sadness because, you get to a point after so many men coming in and out of your life that you can continue to desperately cling to, hoping this is going to be that masculine male influence that you want mm-hmm. as a strapping young man, and then they leave, and you start to look yourself in the mirror and wonder, what's wrong with you? You know, if all these people come in and out of your life and constantly leave and don't stick around— there must be something wrong with you. You must be so flawed that you're not valuable enough for someone to stay and consistently invest in. And that led to, uh, for me, an enormous amount of self-consciousness, um, uh, uh, um, just a, a lot of pain. Um, and I was well into my 40s before... I was able to reconcile all all of it, and so I, 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 you know, the old nature versus nurture question. You're born the way you are, and you have certain things that you're born with that are going to define you. And then nurture, there's a lot of things that happen to you, especially in adolescence, that define who you are. And I think the trauma and the fatherlessness and the self doubt and the eh, 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 and and the pain as a result of all of that also defined a lot of who I am and why I've done much of what I've done in my life. Yeah, and you you and I have a similar story in that a lot of our upbringing and the pain we felt had a big influence and direction on what we chose to do with that pain at at, at some point because we do have options with that either the pain you know, seeps into our body and controls us and we spend the rest of our life being resentful, angry, entitled, justifying our actions, bad behaviors, treating others a similar way, or we deal with it in a different way and figure out how to 
use it in a in a positive way. And I've talked to, you know, so many people and and big part of my story is my parents' divorce also, Bill. And I think people can look over those things like, oh yeah, everybody's parents are divorced. But the reality is it it really is impactful, the upbringing that we have. And I always encourage people to really analyze what that upbringing was and also remember our parents had upbringings and were children at some point and you know we're allowed to feel a certain way but at some point and this is why I love your story we all have to deal and process the trauma or we don't right but if we can figure out a way to heal ourselves that can make a positive influence in other people's life you know you can almost tell yourself that it was all worth it. So let's let's get into that a little bit more. What, I, um, I, I want to tell you, I agree with every single thing you said. And something was said to me by, by a guest on an Army of Normal Folks not, not long ago that I think is interesting and tags on what you said, which is um, you do have to deal with it. And if you're going to have any meaningful existence or effect on this life, you do have to deal with it. And, and a lot of people don't, and they just bury it. Yeah. And the, and the problem is they bury it alive and anything you bury alive will always come back to the surface. Yeah. And so it's, it's, you do have to deal with it. And, and our stories are very similar in that we dealt with a lot and we dealt with it. Um, in much different ways, but we dealt with it. And, um, I, I just don't think you can, I, I don't think you can get out of your own way unless you do figure out how to deal with yeah. trauma for sure. You know, I, well, I'm going to pause you there because I know we're going to get in more of your story, but it, it feels like the first actionable item in this step of making impact is if you're going to play the victim card, if you're going to discredit you know, oh, everybody else's success. You had it much harder. You had it X and lean into the reasons why you can't make impact. You're, you're never going to make impact. I've, I've always said everybody has their own set of advantages and disadvantages, some more than others, some worse than others, but that doesn't change the reality of the situation. And you either learn how to use your advantages and disadvantages to your advantage you figure out a way or you don't but but blaming and talking about how you had it harder doesn't change your life for the positive or anybody else around you and i see it happen so much when other people try to you know discredit other folks of like well i could have done that if i had this it's like well you don't and you know <laughs> you, you 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 might be you know, short, you grew up poor, you grew up, whatever the things are that you think are standing in your way, the more you tell yourself that story, the more it's going to keep you down. It's true. It's absolutely true. Couldn't agree more. Well, so let's talk about how you started to use, use that pain and emotion because your story, I'm sure a lot of people are listening again. Not all of us had picture perfect childhoods. So I want you to try to teach some people who may be in that place right now of, you know, the blaming, the my life was so hard, whatever. How did you work through your emotions, Bill, to figure out how to better your life and get out of that victim mode? So as you can see, I'm a big kind of dumpy redheaded guy, right? And um, all six foot, 270 pounds of me. Now I got a lot of hop for a big man, but you know, I am what I am. And I tripped across this person named Lisa, who's a dime. She's uh, she's amazing. And um, I had kids. We had four kids in four years after we got married. How old were you? I was tw- I was twenty three, and she was twenty one when Maggie was born. Wow. And that meant that Lisa was twenty six with a four year old, a three year old, a two year old, and a one year old. Oh my goodness. That was our family. And I was making $17,000 a year teaching co- teaching school and coaching football, mm-hmm. um, which is why I continued to coach in non-faculty positions and got into business because necessity said, 
diapers and formula and rent um, are greater in some total than the net of seventeen thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And but to answer your question, um, fatherlessness is is such a big thing that defined me because of what we talked about earlier. And here I was, this thirty year old guy with these delicious, beautiful children that were seven, six, five, and four, and this phenomenal woman who decided to pledge her life to me. And every Father's Day, I was a complete ass. Um, Christmas and Thanksgivings, I was unhappy. And to be candid, I didn't even know it. I didn't see it as much. Um, I might have felt it looking back on it, but, and Lisa, you know, finally said to me, do you realize that on holidays and Father's Day that you're just miserable to be around, that you're just really terrible and the children are walking on eggshells around you? Um, It's crushing your family's happiness. And she said, I'm well aware of all the insecurity and pain that you've suffered in your life. And I'm not discounting that. But it is time that you grow up, be a man, quit being victimized by those circumstances, and recognize that you are now a husband and a father to four beautiful children, and you need to celebrate instead of not having a father, being a father. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was when I first heard that, Ann, I thought, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. You grew up in an organic family. You had your mom and dad, your brother and sister, and life was grand for you. The exact thing you're talking about right. was, what do you, do you, you don't talk to me about that. You don't know my reality. You don't understand my narrative. But then as I started to think more about it and I started to recognize my behavior, um, it was clear that, uh, that, my wife, who knows me best of anybody on the face of the planet, was exactly right. And so I had to change my construct. It was no longer poor, pitiful me. I had all this trauma and all this crap in my life, and I'm going to let it now be a drag on the rest of my life and affect my children and my wife in the same way that it affected me. No, I'm not going to give that power Mm-hmm. to these sh- crap people that were in my life, I'm going to take that power back for myself and I'm going to turn around and employ it and I'm going to be a great husband and a great father and I'm going to celebrate fatherhood from a completely different standpoint. And so I changed my construct. I changed my vision of myself in fatherlessness and fatherhood and... um and, and 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 employed uh, the the basic fundamentals and tenets of character and commitment and integrity and dignity and civility, the things that I preach all over the place to my football players and my employees. I looked in the mirror and said, "I got to employ those in my own life." Yeah. You know, I I got to check myself. And um, at around forty years old. I was able to finally drop that trauma as a result of changing my construct and a second thing, understanding the value of forgiveness is really more important to the forgiver than the forgiven. I was able to let go of all of this ill will and dirt and 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 pain that I was harboring by simply forgiving. Even when I wasn't asked for an apology, I mm-hmm. wasn't wasn't all you know. I wasn't offered forgiveness. I just gave it, and when I gave it, it was this this unburdening of all of this stuff that was holding me back from being the fullest self that I could be. And so, through changing my construct, trusting my compass, Lisa, the person who knows me best. And then employing forgiveness to unburden myself, Mm -hmm. I was able to uh, really walk a lot lighter. 
Yeah. And it's such a rarity, Bill, because a lot of people hold on to grudges and they hold on to things. And I, I'm a I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. And there was I went to one of his events and there was something that he he's also very direct. And I agree with the with the approach that direct is kind, because sometimes people need to be told something that doesn't feel good in the moment, but it's going to wake people up. And he says to one of these people in the audience, you love being the victim, don't you? It is the only way you have figured out how to get attention in your life. So you lean into it. People feel bad for you. You know, they come to your side, they comfort you. And it's the only way you figured out how to either get love or or some sort of connection. So you continue to do it. And I just thought that was so powerful. And what you just said about the power, someone doesn't need to apologize to you in order for you to forgive them. Because once you practice forgiveness, and I know there are some people listening that are going to say, well, you don't understand what someone did to me. And, you know, we're talking about abuse. And I'm not saying this stuff is justified. I'm not saying it's right. I- I'm really sorry. And and that, that some of these things have happened to people because there's a lot of tragedy out there. And forgiveness is forgiveness. It doesn't matter how big, how small. You're either a forgiving person or you're not. And I encourage people to think about that because the only person who loses if you don't forgive is you. Now, you don't have to allow that person in your life. You can still have boundaries and forgive that person. But if you don't forgive, as you said, you bury the resentment that is still building and lives in your veins and your blood system, that's going to come out in other relationships, in other areas that now those relationships are going to pay the price for this negative one over there. And two things on what you said. One, when you leverage victimhood to get what you want, you are engaged in nothing less than manipulation. Yeah. And manipulation will never lead to real relationships. So it's if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. If you're leveraging your victimization to get what you want, you will never engage in true relationships. Yeah. The second thing is The guy that shot at me, he shot at my mom. Then I came out and he shot at me. And I know what bullets sound like flying by your head because I was running away from him down a hallway and ducked into a bedroom. And it's oddly, I didn't hear the gun as loudly as I heard the bullet go when it passes by your head and I could hear the hangers in the closet rattling when the bullet went through the closet door and hit the hangers. Mm. And I had to dive out of a a window, ran to a neighbor, knocked on the door at one in the morning, woke him up, called the cops. The cops came, went in the house. The house is destroyed. There's bullet holes all over the place. I was almost shot, and my mom is cowering in the corner of an attic while he's reloading when the cops come in. Um, 20 years later, that same man um, called me and apologized. He joined a men's group at a church. He was very old was not in good health, and begged my forgiveness, which, of course, I gave him. And three days later, he died. Mm. And he died penniless. And he was cremated, and the guys in his church group built him literally a shoebox-sized pine box. And that's what they put his remains in, his ashes. But they had nowhere to bury him. There was no money. And he was from a very small town in Arkansas is where he grew up. And they didn't know what to do with his remains. And I literally drove to Arkansas, talked to a guy who had a a, a, a grave site, a, a, a graveyard in this town. And he gave me this little corner off by a wall. And I literally took a shovel dug the hole, put his remains in it, covered it up, said a prayer and left. 
So the very man that tried to take my mom and my's life one night, not only did I forgive, I literally buried the man. Mm. So I don't want to hear that you can't forgive. I don't want to hear, because I'm telling you, when I tell that story, I tell it for perspective because people always want to know where I come from. Mm -hmm. But I don't tell the story with anger. I don't tell the story with hate. And every time I tell the story, I don't think about the night he shot at him. I think about the day I forgave and buried him because that's the redemption and that cleans me. And I don't hold, I don't, I don't tell that story holding anger and hate and all. I tell it explaining that there are failed people in the world who do things that traumatize others, but it doesn't necessarily make them unredemptive because at the end of this life, this man's life, he was redeemed and I was redeemed. Um, so don't leverage victimhood. It only leads to crap relationships and don't tell me you can't forgive yeah. and that it doesn't mean something because it does. I have a family member who has a very difficult time apologizing and a very difficult time forgiving. And, you know, they're miserable. And the, the, the talk about what you just said of victimhood, um, that's happened to me, too, when this person has treated me poorly and you call them out on it and then they emotionally manipulate the the conversation and lean into victimhood. And it's just like, this is one that's exactly it's like this is not okay to treat someone like to to treat someone like that and it's like i, I i'm going to choose to forgive but i'm going to keep my boundaries up and i think you know what what we're sort of again talking about and that's a really amazing story bill again because if you could have everybody around you for this man who shot at you would have said you have every right to be angry to to hate to let all of these emotions bubble up and for you to feel that toward that person but I can tell you the, the it just doesn't get directed at that person it's impossible for that just to get directed at that person it's going to overflow in other areas and you were astute enough and had the emotional maturity enough to realize if you didn't let that go that's going to bleed in as it, your wife Lisa bleed into your parenthood your marriage in ways when you don't expect it because you're allowing it to be inside you in, in, in some way. It's, it's absolutely true. It just tarnishes me. One last little bit on this before we get to the next thing is, I think it's very important to recognize, and it's not semantics, there is a difference in forgiveness and a pardon. Mm -hmm. I can forgive you, but I cannot pardon your poor actions. Um, there are, there are plenty of people that have created, committed crimes in this country mm -hmm. that we need to forgive and hope that we can enact ways to help them to redeem themselves and pay their debt to society and, and come out the other side, productive members of our culture. But that doesn't mean when you forgive them that you pardon them, mm -hmm. we all pay for the mistakes we make. Yep. We need to be forgiven, but not necessarily pardoned. And we have to understand there is a difference in that. Yeah. Can you speak more about that? Because I think that's a probably a fairly, pretty fine line. And, and does, do you mean by, do you mean what about like forgiving, but also keeping boundaries and, and the forgiveness? Because I guess forgiveness can in some regards be a, a, a a, a selfish act of I'm going to forgive you so that I don't feel these emotions. And again, I'm going to keep you at bay because I don't trust you. I just want to, I'm curious more about your, your. Yeah. All right. Well, let's say you and I are in business together. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm in the lumber business. And so I sell you, you're a cabinet maker. Congratulations, Ann. You're in the cabinet business. Yeah, dream come true. I know it. All right, so I sell you a $30,000 load of um, hard maple that you're going to make cabinets out of. And uh, you call me up and say, uh, this lumber's off grade and it's short on tally. And I'm discounting the bill I'm going to send you by 25, by, uh, by 
five grand. So I'm going to pay you twenty five thousand for your thirty thousand dollar load lumber. Now you have cost me five thousand dollars. Now if I made that mistake, I'm going to make good on it. But I had a uh, uh, certified inspection on it, and I know you're just screwing me out of five thousand dollars. But you're in Malaysia, and I can't fly. I do business in forty two countries. I can't fly to Malaysia over a five thousand dollar claim to check that load of lumber. Mm-hmm. All right, so I eat the five thousand dollars. Now that will piss you off, and and in a business that are low margins, high volume, things like that are very difficult. So I can be angry and and kick the dog and let it blend over into how I treat my employees and everybody around me because I'm really frustrated and angry about the way you've treated me, or I can reconcile that I'm going to have to forgive that. I can't let this screw up the rest of my week, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to do business with you ever again. Got it. I'm not going to pardon you for Mm -hmm. your behavior. I'm going to forgive it so that it doesn't eat me alive. Yeah. I'm going to let you know I forgive it so that you know what kind of person you're dealing with. But I'm also going to tell you, although I forgive you, You'll have to excuse the fact that you can lose my number. I'm not going to do business with you. I cannot pardon your poor behavior, but I can forgive it for me. And I can let you know that you are not going to control through your poor actions, my psyche and the way I'm going to affect the world. I'm forgiving you. You're off of it. I I, I forgive you. You'll never hear about it again. I'm not going to bring it up in conversation. I'm not going to go talk to 20 people about you behind your back and tell you what a scoundrel I think you are. I'm not, I'm, you're forgiven. It's over. It's gone. I'm not going to bring it up anymore. And you're not going to waste any more energy on it. But that's right. But I'm not going to do business with you. Yeah. Yeah. There is a difference in forgiveness and a pardon. Yeah. I see um, e- even, you know, people talk about the best revenge is your success. The best revenge is your money. Best. It's like, I hate to use revenge and forgiveness, but it is some people who are trying to get to you so much. The You want to really cause someone's brain to explode? Just forgive them. Just, it's one of the oldest things in the world. Kill them with kindness. I know. Forgive. Yeah. Forgive and let it go and put a smile on your face. And don't let a toxic individual affect you anymore. Why give up your power to anybody else because you're unwilling to let things go? Newsflash, the world is hard. There are far fewer decent good people in it than there are people that are challenged by morality and honesty and everything else. You are going to trip across people all your life that are going to do things that you feel are wrong or you feel are immoral or don't align with the way you think. But if you harbor all that your whole life, you're never going to get out of your own way. And I just refuse to give my power and and my happiness and my ability to interact with the rest of the world that I want to interact with on a positive basis to the 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 few people who who don't deserve me and so i forgive it i wash my hands of it i let it go but i don't pardon it yeah and guys i also want to be clear that you know because bill you talked about your earlier days bill and i are also not people who've never not played into this you know role either some of it we have you know what i mean because sometimes people it's true oh we've we've never done it's like i've done things i've whatever there are probably people who think i gotta get in mail i'm not you know out of my life because when i was younger i didn't understand you know, some of these things. I didn't understand, uh, again, not the emotional blaming and victimhood and and bad and poor behavior and all of these things. You know, I've had my own fair share of that too. And one of the most uh, unbelievable skills you can learn is this sort of emotional control, emotional capacity. It's what the, I was listening to a podcast with Jay Shetty and he, he went to live with the monks for you know, 18 months or two years. And and he said, that was the reason I went to do it, to learn how to understand and control 
my emotions. And it's easy to say those things when we are in conversation and nothing is upsetting us and we're not feeling anything. But when someone pisses you off or does something to you and you learn to temper your emotions and be mature in those situations, that is such a superpower that very few people have. Most people justify their actions and emotions when someone hurts them. You are, you're right. I'm on your podcast, not going to talk about how you were affected by some of the trauma before you figured your world out. You can share that if you want to, but mine was fighting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, <laughs> clearly I don't have an eating disorder and <laughs> I think said maybe I ate too much. Um, uh, I, I've, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've got a seafood problem. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, eat it. you see it, you eat it, yeah. Right. So, um, but mine was, um, when I was younger, I just, I mean, it, I had a snap temper. Mm -hmm. And and you talk about on the lowest rung of the totem pole of emotional intelligence is where I dwelled. You cross me, I, I'm, again, this is insecurity. This is, this is, this is anger. This is buildup. You cross me, I'll show you what kind of man I am. And, yeah. and, and it's justified because you crossed me first. So I get to behave however I want. You did this, not me. Right. And, yeah. I, and that's because I'm a victim. Right. Of you. And, and so, yeah, everything I'm talking about now comes from the lens of a guy in his fifties who's been through it not the lens of a guy mm -hmm. who married a beautiful woman and had four children and was still struggling to figure it all out. I mean, it absolutely is a process and it, it absolutely is a, a, a an evolution to, mm -hmm. to get to a place like that. But for the listeners of your podcast, you know, if you want to shave off a decade or a decade and a half of misery, here are my words. Yeah. Be be forgiven. Don't be a victim. Don't allow other people to control your power. Don't pardon those who wrong you, but forgive them because by forgiving them, you're letting it go. It's better for you. And and then you have kind of this foundation and this basis of emotional maturity that you can kind of catapult yourself in life. Yeah. And this conversation is going a little different than I thought, but it's going the right way. Because if you want to impact the world, guys, y it's impossible to do it if you're holding on to resentment and grudges. You're sure. never going to, as soon as you can either use those things to better yourself or other people, uh, letting go, there's, there's, no, there's no step that you can skip, you know, or get to the whatever if you're not emotionally sound and peace of mind and a forgiving person it's just it's just not possible it's not it's so absolutely not yeah so let's get into when again you started coaching and because it's a really amazing story and and it reminds me of again back on my feet which is why we've got this connection between us of you know your football career and the individuals that you know you were working with and you know how you got to them, how you, how you got through to them. So I graduated from Ole Miss with a degree in psychology and a degree in English. And I was going to be a child psychologist and save the world. Um, that was what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. because of the way I grew up, I did have two grandfathers, both paternal and maternal that loved me. But when you're 16, 17, old grandfathers, while you might revere them as grandfathers, it's hard to build a relationship with them. And the, the men in my life that kept me between the curbs were my coaches. Those were the guys who mattered the most to me, who I listened to the most, who without whose guidance, I really don't know where I'd have ended up. They were the counterbalance to the, to the drama and trauma I was living at home. And so when I graduated from Ole Miss, um, you know, I couldn't think of a, a better thing to do than to be a coach. And so I started teaching school and coaching football and basketball as a profession for a living while I was working on my doctorate, 
because eventually I want to transition into um, psychology, developmental psychology. Well, um, the plan got blown up by Lisa because I met her and I'm like, holy crap, if she'll marry me, you know, mm -hmm. jackpot, uh, bonanza, Powerball, whatever. And so I got married and we just started having kids and I, I couldn't balance work, kids, wife. And so, and, and, and candidly, I was starting to get disenchanted with the whole idea of being a psychologist. So here I was, this overly educated guy with a wife and a growing family and, um, you know, a, a teacher and a football coach. And so in the state of Tennessee, you can be what's called a non-faculty certified coach. You, you got to go get all kinds of accreditation and stuff, but it allows you by the governing body of inter scholastic athletics to be a full-fledged coach like any other faculty member uh, at any school with this accreditation, but it's a non-faculty position, but you can do it. And so because coaching was a passion of mine, not just winning games, but the mentoring and the outreach because of what it meant in my life, as I transitioned from being a coach and a teacher to um the business world, I continued to coach. So I was living this kind of two lane life of coaching in the evenings because that's where my passion was and chasing, um, a, a professional life because that was necessitated by my family. And I started my business in 2001, uh, with $17,000 and I bought seven acres in a very dilapidated industrial area in North Memphis. And the reason is, is because that's all I could afford. And the reason I was in this crappy area was because that's where the cheapest industrial property was. And I thought I wasn't going to be able to coach. And Manassas High School happens to be a mile from here. And through in a series of weird introductions that were completely happenstance, um, while I'm starting my business, these people of Manassas said, hey, can you come over and, and coach us up a little bit? And I really expected just to go for spring practice for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. When I got there, I found 17 kids on a high school football team who'd won four games in 10 years. They were terrible. Mm. Um, and you have to understand the demographics of North Memphis. It's the fifth poor zip code, I think, in the United States. I think it's got the highest crime rate per capita in the United States. An 18-year-old male is three times more likely to be incarcerated or dead by wow. his 21st birthday than he is to have a job. Uh, only 1.3% of the people from this area have a, have a college diploma. Fewer than half have an operating car. 87% of the high school kids named the grandmother as the head of the household, it is disenfranchisement, poverty, all of it. But I show up to coach football and those two weeks turned into seven years because I found there, even though they didn't look like me, even though they didn't identify like me because they were, I mean, in seven years, I had one white student and one Hispanic student. The rest were all black. And so you got this weird thing that in Memphis, in the deep south, in the city that Martin Luther King was assassinated in, you have this white guy coaching all these black kids, and you would assume there's this racial overtone to it. But ironically enough, there what I was just there to coach, and the kids just wanted to be part of something good. And the movie is my last year there, where you find 75 kids on the team, you find a team whose record over the previous two years was 18 wins and two losses and a complete turnaround. Um, and I will say it is because that was my passion, but it wasn't just my passion to, to coach football. It was my passion to reach and mentor kids who, despite the fact they didn't come from where I come from or look like I looked, I identified with in a real and personal way because the most traumatic things in their life was the most traumatic things in my life, which was fatherlessness. Yeah. And, and so this odd, odd relationship developed 
between people from two different worlds based around the most traumatic experiences of their life. And this beautiful thing came of it, which was my personal growth, hopefully most of my players' personal growth, and the narrative that undefeated is not about wins and losses on a football field, but not being defeated by your circumstances, mm -hmm. not being a victim, mm -hmm. and throwing away societal preconceived notion about what people should, what people would normally say about some white dude that's a business owner with a very organic family and a bunch of black kids from the hood and how, how that interaction is supposed to look. And when you break down these societal preconceived notions and you simply serve and lead and work with one another, that amazing things can happen in all of our lives. And they did. Yeah. So this is, again, for those of you who don't know anything about my story, why there's similarities between Bill and I. So Back on My Feet, which is the running organization I started, same thing. I'm a young white blonde girl from North Dakota. And most of the men I was coming across in homeless shelters were also black. And so it was like, what is this white girl doing in here? But what they didn't realize in the beginning was my dad's an addict. My, my, my dad had very similar struggles. Most of the back of my feet members were dealing with addiction and uh, they had found themselves in, you know, in a homeless shelter because their addiction was winning and how familiar that story was for me. You know, who knows where my, my dad would be if he didn't find my mom. And, you know, I've seen my dad continue to struggle with addiction throughout the, his life with gambling and which tore apart my family. But the same the same connection that you had with these individuals that you were coaching of a difficult upbringing, um, maybe they had a difficult upbringing, you know, but like you're 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 connecting with them to that. There was it was nothing about race. And I don't know about you, Bill, but when I started back on my feet, I had felt like I found my people, people who understood me, people that I felt like I understood and we were going to work together to make our lives better and not let our past experiences define us. And I'm sure for a lot of those kids, uh, once they got to know you, you know, respected you be because of what you have gone through and how you've worked through that and got to the position that you were in. Um, I don't know if people can even fully understand the two things I'm about to say to you about what you just said. One is the grace that those kids and that very desperate situation had in their hearts. And I, I illustrate it this way. They welcomed me into their neighborhood and their school a whole lot more readily than they would have been welcomed into my culture. Mm -hmm. Right. None of this happens if they don't first say, come on in, mm -hmm. you know, I accept you regardless of who you are and what you look like. And I don't know that many of those kids sleeved up with tats, all of the things that are sensationalized on the news and the media yeah. and the movies. Yeah. Those are what my kids look like. And many of them were in games. Um, but they accepted me a whole lot more readily than the picture of the kid I just gave you would have accepted in the suburbs. I got, I got chills from that because that 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 is a really important part to this. And I got accepted in this same way also. And it would have been very easy to be like, who does this? Are you are you kidding me? Who, who do you think you are coming in? You don't know us and understand us. They gave me the opportunity without judgment, without um, dismissiveness. Right. So when, so when people pat you on the back and me on the back and they say, yeah. and you're amazing. Look yeah. at what, what amazing, look at the lives you've changed where people come to me and they say, and, and I just, I honestly just cringe when it's like, look at all the wonderful things yeah. you don't understand. My life was enriched mm -hmm. as a result of, of, of all of it. This, the, the second thing I want to tell you is that I think you may understand and some other people might have to really think about is I identified with the kids of Manassas 
so much deeper than I identified with my own children. My children didn't grow up the way I did. That didn't mean I don't love my children. I cherish my children. But the truth is, my reality, I identified with the kids at Manassas. Not, I didn't identify really with my own kids. I didn't grow up the way they did. And thank God my children didn't have to grow up like that. But the point is, one of the reasons the barriers came down and we found success is because they let me into their world more readily than people in my world would have let them in. And then we found out that, hey, just because we don't look each look like each other, come from the same place, the truth is we're, we're woven of the same cloth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's um thanks for reminding me of that because that's a, 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 you're right and I've always said my life, you know, threw back on my feet. I got I got healed. You know, I needed I needed that just as much if not more than the members who were living in the in the shelters and we and we needed each other. Like I don't think I would have healed. I think I would have hung on to resentment and anger and again uh, unfortunate justifiable uh, justifiable actions if I, if I didn't meet them. The, the similarities are interesting, and I just thought about it, was how forgiveness is really better for the forgiver than the forgiven. In the same respect, outreach and hard work in communities like you served in and I served in, the payoff is you get 20 times more out of it than you put in it. It's yeah. actually what you get out of the work is 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 more enlightening for your soul than it is for the people you're in there serving. Yeah, it, it's you know it, again, it's it's about a, a mental construct about the truth of what occurs when you're willing to have the emotional maturity to be honest with yourself and those around you, break societal preconceived notions, and just go to work. Yeah, I mean, listen, what I'm hearing and and would uh, condone is you want to impact the world. First, start with forgiveness, and then start, and then you go to service. You can't yeah. be in service without forget without forgiveness or wanting to forgive. But that has to be the. Are you a forgiving person? Can you, can you, you know, look at your life and say, yeah, I had it difficult, but I'm going to use that. I never, I never would have started back on my feet without my dad's addiction issues and the disruption that that caused in my family. I never would have felt a connection or a need to help or a need to any of those things. So how can I not look at that part of my life and be thankful uh, that I was able to use that to provide positive influence and empowerment to a lot of other people, you know, in, in their lives? Like it's all about your perspective and your attitude I don't care who you are, Bill, how much money you have, what you look like, how healthy you are. It, it, it's, it's your life is about the story you tell yourself and the perspective you choose to see every single day. Sure. Forgiveness and, and service are cornerstones of leadership and success. There's mm-hmm. no doubt about it in my mind. Yeah. Um. Well, we are close to our time. So I want to, and again, we could sit here and talk for four hours uh, and it would feel like an hour. Um, Anything else that you can share with the the listeners on maybe some folks who feel like they want to make impact or are struggling besides the forgiveness, you know, and service piece that you think would be helpful for them? Yeah. And it's going to be in the form of a shameless plug, but I, I do it. I, I do it honestly. Okay. Um, so this this podcast that you are on, an army of normal folks. The idea is this: um, the people in New York who control our, our, who largely control our national media, they're incented by enormous wealth and power Mm -hmm. to continue to feed us narratives that divide us. The the people in D.C. gain enormous power, and I still don't understand how people making $178,000 a year as House of Representatives people end up millionaires, but they do. So, obviously, enormous power and wealth. And they are also incented 
to craft narratives that to retain their power and wealth are divisive. Mm -hmm. And so I get asked all the time, which is kind of the topic that we were supposed to be on, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, how do we make the world a better place? And, And at the same time, we know the things I just said. Pew Research is interesting. It, it, there was a Pew Research thing that said that like close to 70% of the people polled say that they know that anything they get from the national media is slanted to one political viewpoint or another. And 85% of the stuff they get from social media is slanted heavily one face or the other. There's a 40, less than a 40% approval rating of the White House. There's under a 20% approval rating of Congress. For the first time in our history, there's under a 50% approval rating of our Supreme Court. So what all that says is we know the power class in our country is incented by power and money to divide us. Mm -hmm. Research says we know what we're being fed is wrong and we don't believe it. And... Polls show that we don't trust anybody with that power, yet the same poll will tell you that the average American spends almost three hours a day reading and inundating themselves with the very information and narratives that they don't trust. Mm-hmm. So here's the, here's, the, here's the paradigm. We don't believe, we don't trust, but we feed ourselves on a daily basis like sheep with the very stuff that Uh divides us. Okay, so the question is, how do we fix it? Well, my suggestion is an army of normal folks. My suggestion is we start to understand we are being led like sheep for the power and money that incents us to be led by sheep by narratives that we rightly don't trust, but we listen to anyway, And let's shut out that noise for a little bit, and let's say this. I don't care if you're black, white, Asian, Hispanic. I don't care if you're male, female, gray, straight. I don't care if you're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, agnostic. I don't care. But if you're a normal person who goes through normal struggles and struggles with insecurities and thing and and trauma and and money troubles and all the things that you and I experience in our life that every normal person experiences in their life if you will take time out of your life to do something that improves the lives of somebody in your corner of the world you're just a normal folk person that sees a place in, of need and 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 fills it because you have a passion for that i don't care who you are where you come from how you vote how you worship how you think I can celebrate you. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine this army of normal folks like you and me who just came from all kinds of stuff and and we build this community of people that regardless of who you are, where you come from or how you think, and we can celebrate the one thing that can't divide us is our humanity. And if we can have civil, non-threatening conversations about the stuff that matters, and not let the cancel culture, the fear of cancel culture, prohibit us from even having a conversation in the first place. Celebrate normal people who are doing extraordinary things in their world that nobody knows about, and build this community, this veritable army of normal folks that share their contact information and share their stories. I think we have an opportunity to change the country because we take our power back from the people who are incented to take our power for themselves and divide us. And so I genuinely believe this idea, this podcast that's supposed to be interesting and redemptive and funny and will make you cry and will make you laugh and will entertain you, I genuinely believe the bigger notion of creating a community in it and around it of normal folks celebrating one another, regardless of who you are, where you come from, how you vote or how you think, and joining together in community to celebrate the one thing that can't divide us, which is our humanity, based on forgiveness, based on grace, based on service, that maybe we really can change the narrative that if you don't think, look, or vote like me, you're my enemy. Mm -hmm. 
Instead, we can all be part of an army of normal folks that serves our country. Yeah, we forget that the people who are in the system that we want to change the system, the system is working for. You know, I mean, I, you know, it's a it's a big old yeah, it's a big I, old nasty circle, and, totally. and and it bothers me because like I really mean it. I feel like we're like sheep. We just oh, we know it's crap, but I don't know. I don't know any other thing to do but just to follow the crap. What yeah. can we not be better than that? I, I yeah. just. And, and, and if, and, and there's safety in numbers, you know? And so if we build this community, this army of normal folks, you have another place to experience ideas and passion and, and thought, and you don't have to, you don't have to shade or categorize what you're hearing or what you're seeing by some political or religious or any other kind of viewpoint. You can just celebrate the humanity. And I do not know where you are politically, religiously, or any other category that we compartmentalize ourselves in. But I can tell you this, and I know that after Back on My Feet, you've gone and built a business and sold it and you're doing other stuff and you've done amazingly beautifully well for your life and it doesn't look anything like you thought it would look like when you were 13. But I can tell you this. What you did when you were struggling with your own demons at 27 years old with back on my feet, I don't give two craps how you vote or how you worship or how you think. What you did was beautiful, and I can celebrate that, and I can love you for that, and I can, I can, I can tell people how much I support you for that. That breaks through all the crap. So if it's how do we fix all this division— it's let's celebrate the humanity in us. And and look for the good in people instead of the other way around. We're trained to do that as well. I've had people ask me, you know, I'll give you just a simple example and then we'll wrap up. But people, oh my God, Anne, you know, I loved what you did with the, back on my feet, the nonprofit. I want to help underprivileged kids learn music. How do I do that? And my response is always, go find somebody who doesn't have access to music and teach them. Like it, it, you know, it's like, you've got to have a day one, a step one, that, that is how you make change. And last Christmas, um, me and my friends, we walked around Manhattan for a couple hours and we handed out $15,000 in cash, hundred dollars here, hundred dollars (laughs) here. And, and at the end of it, we were like, gosh, we could have handed out a billion dollars. And the next day, there would have still been people in need. And you can either look at that as a reason not to do anything, or you say, "Yeah, but I, but all these people that we that we helped and gave money to, yeah, the money is going to help." But we just restored a little bit of humanity in those people of like, I just want to help out. I hope this makes your Christmas a little bit brighter and a little more merrier, and that you can do something with this that maybe you couldn't have done without the money. You know what I mean? So it's like we just think, oh, it's not worth doing unless it's going to have this tidal wave through the world. Well, if that's the case, no one would ever do anything because we're going to impact one person, then two. It starts It starts with a little snowball that can grow. And if you're not willing to start there, you're never going to make an impact. It does. And I want to tell you something. I got the same question, Ann, after Undefeated and after my book and I do speeches and all of that, I, I got forever the question, I'm so inspired by what you did at uh, at at Manassas or whatever, and I I, I want to I'm so inspired to help. How do I do it? The same question you get, right? And I'll be honest, I've done a lot of Q and A's, speeches, you know, all of that, and I've learned how to answer most of the canned questions that I get pretty well. Mm-hmm. That was a question, and that I always really struggled with because. I get, you're absolutely right. Find somebody who's in need and go fill it. But I also get people's fears and inhibitions and not everybody's comfortable enough in their own skin to just go do it and and all of that. Here's another reason I really believe in this project I'm involved in. Every one of our guests give their personal contact information. I give my personal contact information. In creating this Army of Normal Folks podcast and the community that grows around it, if you listen long enough, 
you're going to hear a story that matches a skill set that you have with a passion that you have. And now, if you want to know how to go do it, you've got a beautiful example of how to do it, how it's been pulled off, and someone or some group of people to call to help walk you through the process to get you started. Yeah. And, and so I think an army of normal folks answers a question that you and I have been asked many times, which is, how do I start? Well, here's how you start. Listen, join this community. Eventually, you're going to hear a story and and be connected with people who've done the very thing that you find interesting. And then you can use them as a template and use them as mentors to help you get started. Can you imagine in five years what a community like that would look like and could be doing for our country? Yeah. People always want to skip step number one and go to step number 97. We, we, yeah, we, want, the su- we want the Super Bowl Sunday without the years of of practice. We want the Olympic gold medal without the, you know, four years of work to get there. And it start it starts with day one. It, it's it's you know, you gotta start somewhere. And anybody that you look at that you respect, that you that you're inspired by, had a day one, had something when it was small. Uh, that's the only way things start. That's it. Absolutely true. Well, Bill, thank you so much. You guys, again, if you want to look for Bill Podcast, an army of normal folks is the podcast, which I assume you can find Bill on Apple, on anywhere people find bo- podcasts, Spotify, right? It's not exclusive anywhere. No, we're distributed by iHeart, but it's okay. iHeart, Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to your podcast, cool. get on it. Please subscribe to it and download it so it actually comes up on your library and listen to it and give us a shot. Rate it, review it, share it on social, help us grow it because it 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 is not this is not a a financial thing for me where I'm trying to make a bunch of money with podcasts. I'm literally trying to use whatever little platform I've got and whatever voice I've got to try to, as your title is, fix and change um so much of what ails us right now in our culture. Yeah, that's awesome. Same. My podcast is the is the same. It's just to put some information out there that hopefully can help people. And then yeah. also check out, you know, Bill's documentary, you guys, uh, Undefeated or his book Against the Green. Bill, thank you so much. This was such a enlightening, fun, inspiring, um, graceful conversation. So thanks for for sharing. And I'm sure a lot of people are gonna find it very useful. And and I hope a lot of people, you know, use it to to change their to change their attitude a little bit and their perspective on what's possible for them and what they're capable of impacting. Thanks so much for having me in.